Well, please have a seat. So as, as we begin thinking about these family values, um, the first uh, value that we come to is gather. You know, and with these family values, we're thinking, what does it mean to be an active member of the church family here at Sunbridge Road Mission? What are we committing to with one another? And we're going to look at um, six, eventually, gather, grow, serve, pray, give, go. And we start today with gather. And our commitment, you know, our value is that we meet together regularly to worship God, to hear from his word, and encourage one another. And maybe you think, look, Matthew, surely that just goes without saying. But actually, this year, our commitment to gathering together as God's people has really come under question, hasn't it? And come under threat. And maybe more than, certainly more than I can remember. You know, the uh, periods this year, the government's made it illegal for us to meet in person. At other times, and still at the moment, there's restrictions, aren't there? on what it looks like when we meet together. Some of us have got into habits where, you know, we'll think, oh, I'll just watch it online later, that we could never imagine of being in a year or two ago. And, and actually, I think, pers- speaking personally, one of the main sadnesses of the pandemic, as I look at the UK church as a whole, is actually how easily people have given up gathering together as God's people, how little we fought for it at times. You know, it should be a given, shouldn't it? Actually, the word that's translated church in the New Testament is a Greek word, ekklesia, and that literally means gathering or assembly. You know, so in in ancient Greece, the ekklesia was an assembly of Greek citizens. You know, they were called together out of the wider society. But obviously, the, the biblical ekklesia is an assembly not of Greek citizens, is it, but of citizens of heaven. All those who've been called out of the world who belong to Jesus. So by definition, if you like, the church is a gathering, an assembly of people. You know, there's the universal church, isn't there? The great gathering of God's people across the world throughout history that one day will be revealed. And then there's the local church, bound by space and time. Think of how Paul begins some of his letters. To the church of God in Corinth. To the gathering of God's people in Corinth, in this particular place at this particular time. And, um, you know, this gathering really began in a way, didn't it, after God's Spirit came at Pentecost. So I'm just going to read some verses from Acts 2. And these verses are are straight after, um, you know, Jesus has sent the Spirit um, to be among his people, uh, and Peter has proclaimed um, to the people. Then we get these verses in Acts 2. We kind of see the response that came about. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. And it's a wonderful description, isn't it, of God's Spirit at work forming a new community. You know, that's the fruit, isn't it, of the Spirit's coming. Straight away, a new community begins to form. And I I wonder if you notice a few details. One that really struck me is every day they met together in the temple courts. You didn't have to kind of nag them to get together. They, They wanted to be together, you know, all the time because of what God was doing among them. And really, you know, that's my longing for us as a church family. Sometimes I think we can slip into the kind of what's the bare minimum we can get away with, can't we, approach. But I long that, you know, just like here in Acts 2, our approach is, is more how often can we gather together as God's people because we want to be together. And, and what, you know, why? why? Why do we gather together? Well, we're going to look at three reasons. There's others, but I think these are three big ones. To worship God to hear from his word, and to encourage one another. So firstly, to worship God. And we, we heard from Psalm 100 earlier. You know, Psalm 95 is a very similar invitation to worship. And um, Just let, let, listen as I read the first um, few verses to what we're being invited to and the reasons that we're given. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, 
and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. This is a wonderful invitation, isn't it? To come and to worship the living God. And it's clear here that worship is much bigger than singing. It includes singing. Singing is a wonderful part of worship, isn't it? But it's much bigger than singing. You know, we're invited to praise in song. We're invited to give thanks. It talks about bowing down. You know, actually, probably, culturally, you know, when they heard this word worship, they would have thought of prostrating themselves on the ground, you know, giving God honor for how great he is. You know, it talks, doesn't it, here about kneeling. You know, worship in that sense is giving God the response and the recognition he's due. That's much bigger than singing songs together, isn't it? Singing songs is a, a, a significant part of our worship, but that's an attitude of heart that we acknowledge who God is and what he's done. And did you notice the reason that we're given here to worship God? For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. For he is our God and we are his people. See, actually, the reason we're given to worship God isn't actually about us, is it? It's not because it's great for us, though actually it is good for us. The reason we're given is because God is great and he's worthy of our worship. We gather, actually, because God, our God, is worthy of our praise, he's worthy of our worship, he's worthy of our acknowledgement and recognition. And we, we live today in a culture, don't we, of individualism and consumerism. That's all around us. That's the kind of the sea that we swim in, if you like. And so the question that's always being asked in, in, in our culture is, what's in it for me? What do I get out of it? And obviously that's the question we naturally start to ask of the church as a result, don't we? You know, do I feel like it this Sunday? What's in it for me? What do I get out of it? You know, it was my daughter Lucy's birthday last Sunday. Imagine if I got up that morning. You know, she was up early, as you can imagine, pretty excited, ready to get going with the presents. Imagine if I got up that morning and said, oh, I'm, I'm tired, actually, this morning. I, I don't really feel like birthdays, uh, Lucy. I, I think I'll just have a quiet one. It's not on, is it? It's not about me. But yet, don't we do that to God in some ways? And how much more significant and important is God than Lucy? The reason, actually, we're given to worship God is because of who he is. So maybe the question that needs to be on our minds isn't so much what pleases me, but what pleases him. In, uh, in Romans chapter 1, I think in some ways we see the opposite of worship. So there's a description in Romans 1 of what a godless society looks like. And here's, here's one of the, the, the sentences. It speaks of people who, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God... Or gave thanks to him. Do you see how that's almost the opposite of worship, isn't it? Instead of acknowledging God for who he is, you know, we ignore him. We, we live as if he doesn't exist. We live in God's world. We enjoy his gifts. But he, we give him no recognition. We give him no thanks. We live as if he didn't exist. And, you know, obviously worship is much bigger than a Sunday service, isn't it? You know, we're called to worship with all of our lives. You know, so... It's not just when we come down to a service that we're worshipping, but actually these gatherings on a Sunday are helpful, aren't they, to us? And I think we've probably seen this year why they're helpful in some ways. I think for me personally, there's a sense to which it was a tradition. It's something we always did. I think this year, because it's been called into question, I've seen actually how vital it is that we gather together regularly as God's people to acknowledge him. Because actually as we stop doing that, as we give up doing that, it's pretty quick before actually we live lives as if he didn't exist. We drift that way, don't we? And actually, it's, it's his kindness to us to gather us together regularly, just as in his wisdom he says, take the, the bread and the cup regularly so that you remember the cross. Because again, what do we drift into? We drift into God loves me because of what I've done. So actually, I think our gathering together, you know, on Sundays like this, as well as other times you know, during the week, in more informal ways, you know, actually, they help us throughout our lives, don't they, to acknowledge God for who he is. And that's been, you know, that's been the pattern, actually, right from the early church. You know, of course, they've gathered all over. In different, we saw that in Acts 2 every, every day. But there's, the pattern emerged from very early on, that on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, you know, Sunday morning, the resurrection day, God's people would meet and gather. And actually, God's people have found that a helpful practice, you know, over centuries. And it's a helpful one for us today. So I think this means a commitment to gathering 
actually whether we feel like it or not. You know, there are some days actually where I'm sure we're kind of, you know, excited about being God's people. If we're honest, there are some days where we don't wake up like that, do we? Where actually we'd quite enjoy just staying at home, having a slow morning, and, you know, maybe doing something else. Maybe the weather's beautiful and we want to go for a walk instead. But we gather to worship God. And every day, you know, every week, he's worthy of our praise, isn't he? And one of the real encouragements for me, um, you know, in this year has actually been our commitment as God's people to keep gathering. It's been harder to gather, hasn't it? There's been risks in gathering. It's been a less enjoyable experience. But it's been encouraging to me that actually all the way through, we've kept gathering as his people because he's worthy of our worship. So the second reason that we gather is to hear from his word. And I'm not going to read the rest of Psalm 95, but the next thing it says is, if you hear his voice today, listen to what he's got to say and take it seriously. And that makes sense, doesn't it? If we respect someone, if we think they're important, then we'll want to hear what they've got to say. And throughout the Bible, we see God's people gathered under his word in really significant ways. You know, think of Mount Sinai, you know, that great gathering of God's people after they'd come out of Egypt. You know, all of, all of Israel is gathered, aren't they, around the mountain. And what happens? God gives them his word. Moses brings God's word down to God's people. Or think of, you know, what happens in Nehemiah 8 when, when God's people are back in the land after exile and they've, they've rebuilt Jerusalem. You know, what, what happens next? Well, everyone gathers again. They come in, you know, and gather as God's people. And Ezra gets up and he reads out God's word, doesn't he? You know, people gather again under God's word. And we saw, we saw that just now in Acts 2. What, what were they doing when they gathered in the temple courts? They were, they were listening to the apostles' teaching. You know, they were gathering together under God's word. And that's why we spend a significant amount of time in our gathering together hearing from God's word. This, isn't, you know, pr- this time in, this, in, in our services isn't a book study. You know, in, in the same way you might have a kind of Shakespeare group that gets together to discuss it. Because God's word is different, isn't it? It's living and active. He speaks through his word to us today. That's how he directs us. That's how he builds us up. That's how he reveals himself to us. And how he makes his ways known. I'm I'm going to read some verses from 1 Peter that speak about this. So this is 1 Peter 1, um, starting at verse 23. It says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up into your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Do you see what this is saying? It's saying it's God's word, isn't it, that brings us life. And it's through the gospel, through us hearing of the Lord Jesus, that we come to life in him. And it, it speaks about the frailty of our existence, doesn't it? Again, we felt that this year. And relative to that, God's word is enduring and everlasting. It's the solid thing in the midst of a fragile world. But it's not just that God's word brings us life initially as a Christian, but it's God's word that sustains us, that helps us to grow and mature. I remember someone once saying to me that he said, you know, the week-by-week preaching of God's word is a bit like your mum's cooking growing up. You know, actually, week-by-week, it it built you up, didn't it? It made you strong. It might not have been actually you can remember any of those meals that well, and that's okay. Because actually, over time, it's done its work, hasn't it? And it's built you up, and it's equipped you, and it's strengthened you. And you you, you saw the, um, the, the language there of a newborn baby, you know, craving spiritual milk and it's talking there again about our craving for God's word you know I've just been into the 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 creche to serve communion and and you know the mums in there will be very aware that that newborn babies have a one-track mind don't they milk is on their mind 24 7 and they're unashamed about it you know they're happy to make a fuss to get it Uh, George is not quite a newborn baby but you know still in the middle of the night he'll he'll get up on you know stand up hold onto his cot rail and just wail for milk you know he doesn't mind if he disturbs the whole house He's got one thing on his mind. And actually, you see, Peter's saying we should be like that for God's word. You know, because we've experienced God's word, we've tasted it, we've seen the good it's done us. We should, we should be hungry and eager. You know, we, 
We're to be a church that comes together to hear God's word with anticipation and excitement, with eagerness. You know, that we're coming together expecting God to speak to us, expecting the living God to speak into our lives, expecting him to get things done. And I think one of the things that means is when we come and gather as God's people, we have to make space for that, don't we? If our lives are already fully sorted, you know, we're not going to make any changes, there's no room for God to speak in and direct us. Actually, part of this means coming, expecting God to direct us and shape us and build us up and speak into different areas of our lives. And, and I think this, might, this will mean that you know, we're eager to gather under the word. You know, we've, obviously, we've just started bringing back the evening service in person. And at the moment, numbers have been quite small. And actually, it's not, it doesn't matter, does it, that particular services go well or don't go well. What matters is that we're a church that's hungry for God's word. You know, I, I hope that we're a church where actually where there's opportunities for us to hear from God, where there's opportunities, you know, to be enriched by his word, we're eager to come together and hear. And, and I remember, um, I think this week, you know, Suzanne was just mentioning how um, for her that service has been a real blessing because often in the morning she's serving, you know, doing the kids stuff, but that's a time where actually she can sit and receive and hear clearly. So that might be, you know, it might be you're serving off on a Sunday morning, you know, you're on the door or something. And actually, you don't really get to hear much um, from, from what is said. Um, but actually, you know, let's, let's be a church that comes not because we, we feel we ought to, but because we want to, because we're eager for God's word to have its way in our lives. So we, we gather together uh, to worship God, to hear from his word. Thirdly, to encourage one another. And I think these are verses we've kept coming back to. Now, I'm going to read from Hebrews 10. You know, throughout this year, these verses, I think, have, been, um, have kind of kept coming up, haven't they? And um, Hebrews 10, verses 23 to 25 say this. They say, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. They could have been written, well, it could have been written today, couldn't they? You know, the same dynamic is going on then. The, the author of Hebrews is writing to believers who are facing struggles and hardship. And they're tempted to give up on Jesus and go back to the life they knew before. And do you see what his appeal is to them? Keep on meeting together. You know, God uses that to encourage you, to spur you on, to keep going. And... Um, Actually, earlier in the book of Hebrews, in in Hebrews chapter 3, he says, encourage one another daily. You know, we don't just encourage each other when we meet together like this, do we, on a Sunday. You know, it's going to be, again, it's going to be bigger than that. It will be in a growth group. It will be as we send a message. You know, it will be be throughout the week. And I suppose in that sense, if we we add this in um, to to what it looks like for us to gather together, maybe this triangle is helpful um, in, in describing these different components. So there are ways in which, as we gather together, we're directing uh, our, our prayer, our praise towards God, aren't we? There are ways in which we're receiving from him. And I know it's not as straightforward as this. Um, it's more mixed than this. But, the, you know, as we hear from his word, and in many ways, you know, the Lord's Supper is a word in picture form, isn't it? A visible word for us that we're receiving from God. But sometimes we can stop there. We can, we can think about our gathering as really between us and God. But you see that component at the bottom. Part of why we gather together is to encourage one another. There's something that ought to be going on between us. And that's encouragement, you know, spurring each other on. That's using our gifts to serve one another. Um, And that's a really important part of why we gather together. And I think if we leave that out, sometimes we don't get the importance and significance of these kind of gatherings. Um, Spurgeon spoke about it as coals in a fire. You know, if if you've got a coal fire... When they're all piled up together and it's got hot, they stay hot, don't they? They burn red hot. You know, and the nice thing about a coal fire is once it's going, you can just kind of leave it. But what happens if you take one of those coals out and you put it on the side of the grate? Well, it's hot for a moment, isn't it? But it quickly begins to fade. And then before long, it's just smoking. And then it's gone out. And it's very much like that for us as believers. You know, we need one another to keep us going, don't we? You know, we spoke in our vision statement of wanting to be a church that is on fire for Jesus. But we're we're not going to be able to do that on our own. Actually, we need each other to keep us going. And lots of us will know this from our own experience. When we pull away from God's people, we end up like that coal, don't we? You know, it's not long before we're discouraged. 
and disheartened. Because that's not the way God's meant it to be. He's called us into a people to encourage one another. And I think this is one of the big problems with online church. And again, this has, just been, this has been raised this year in a huge new way, hasn't it? You know, it doesn't matter if we're just watching online. You know, and, and I'm sure, like, you know, the, the, lots of times that's where we've, we've gone. I'll, I'll just watch it on YouTube. Well, again, if our, if our understanding of church is it's something we consume, so, so it, it's, it's something we get, you know, whether that's an experience or, or content, then maybe you can replace it through online. But if our understanding of church is a family, well, at, at, where we've we're all got something to contribute, online doesn't cut it, does it? And I think, and, and actually it's, it's in this place so often that I think we feel it. It's that mutual encouragement. So if, if you're in a meeting connecting online, you will receive from the meeting, but actually you lose the opportunity to encourage others so often because you're just a stat on the YouTube numbers. So do you see, if our vision for gathering together is that each of us actually have a role to play in encouraging one another, then some, you know, watching through YouTube doesn't include that, does it? And I know there's been all sorts of reasons why that's been necessary. And will be necessary. You know, there's some people who, you know, long after COVID, actually, for other reasons, aren't able to come in person. But you see, actually, if we're, as we're making those decisions, it's so important to remember that part of our gathering is to encourage each other. We do that in lots of ways, don't we? We do that by serving. You know, so this morning, actually, all kind, lots of different people have been serving in different ways. You know, whether that's on the tech desk, whether that's welcoming people on the door, whether that's leading music whether that's, at the moment, being out in the kids' groups, whether that's cleaning afterwards. There's, there's lots of serving that we don't see. But actually, if we're not here, we miss out on that, don't we? We're not able to serve one another. We, I think we encourage each other just by our presence. So actually, as you look around and see one another here, it's an encouragement, isn't it? Look around. You know, it's okay. <laughs> look around. It's encouraging, isn't it, to see one another. Because we realize we're not on our own in following. It might be in our workplace or our family or our neighborhood. We are on our own following Jesus. And it's hard work. And it's encouragement to come together, isn't it? And look around and see we're doing this together. And we encourage one another with our words. You know, I think um, that's one of the reasons it's been hard not being able to mingle, isn't it? And gather together. So often that was the time where we could go up to someone and just spur them on in a little way. But it's not, you know, the, the, there can be a danger even if we're here in person of being passive, can't there? You know, of, of coming and being a spectator. And I, I long for us to be a church where actually all of us are coming with that mindset. How can I encourage someone this morning? How can I spur someone on in a little way? And it, it might be, you know, sometimes there's another dynamic to this. Uh, one thing I've noticed, um, and it's there in my own life as well as seeing it in others, when we're struggling... There's a temptation, isn't there, to pull away from God's people. You know, we could be struggling for all sorts of different reasons. But there's a temptation at that stage to pull away, to stop gathering with God's people. But actually, it's in those moments that we most need God's people to come around us. You know, and, and actually, if we do that, if we go through our struggles on our own, we're cutting off one of the main ways God has of helping us keep going. Do you see that from Hebrews? You know, this is something God's given us. He's given us one another. So if we withdraw from that, it's a bit like, you know, Hebrews elsewhere talks about the Christian life as a marathon. You know, it, it, there are hard bits. You know, there are times where we're going to really feel it. And, and pulling away from God's people is a bit like choosing to run that marathon without any crowds and without any water breaks. You know, it's actually when we gather together, we're cheered on, aren't we, by God's people. And we're refreshed and spurred on. So, you know, maybe, that's, maybe you're connecting at home and, and you've pulled away. I encourage you to come back to God's people because it's, it's so often the means he used to keep us going. Now, what, you know, what would it it'd be good for us to think more, wouldn't it? And maybe we can do this in growth groups on Tuesday. What would it look like if we really embraced this as a church? You know, this is Paul's vision. Um, there's some verses in Romans 1, and they'll come up on the slides. Um, I, I, didn't, I wasn't that familiar with these verses, but Bruce really loves them and has, has put them, I think, on our heart as a church, where Paul says, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Do you see his heart? He wants to be with them, doesn't he? But not just to hang out, but he longs to, to, to mutually encourage one another, to spur each other on. And I think, you know, that on a, what might that look like on a Sunday? For us to, to come to the gathering thinking 
This morning, I want to encourage someone. This evening, I want to encourage someone. I want to spur someone, other, someone on. You know, maybe that's saying thanks for what they've done and recognizing that. Maybe it's someone that we know and we can just check in. Maybe it's, you know, particularly in this season, connecting with someone who, who might be more isolated and arranging to meet up in the week. What might that look like in a growth group? You know, to connect, thinking, I want to encourage someone this evening. Or when we meet up with, with another brother or sister, you know, to, to, just for a walk or a coffee or whatever it is, to think, actually, I want to make sure I encourage them in some way before we go to, together. And I think, you know, obviously there are challenges in this right now, aren't there? And it's easy for us to think, look, this sounds great, Matthew, but at the end of the service, you're going to say, please leave in orderly fashion and go straight home. <laughs> there are challenges, aren't there? But you see, if our heart is Paul's heart, we'll find ways to do this. We'll work around it, won't we? And, and at the moment, I think one of the best ways to do that is if we can't talk here, is actually to say, look, let's go for a walk together this afternoon. Let's make Sunday afternoons as a church our times of fellowship still. But we might need to do that in gardens or a park. But you see, if this is our heart, we'll find ways, won't we? We can message. We can send a card. We can knock on a door. And sometimes I think, you know, the other thing that can be an obstacle for us is we can, we can say, look, Matthew, this is easy for someone like you. You know, you don't mind going and speaking to people. I find that really hard. You know, I'm, I'm shy. I find that more difficult. And yet I think, you know, God calls us all to this and gives us all different ways we can encourage each other. It doesn't have to look the same, does it, for each of us? I remember one of my um, professors at Bible College, and actually his personality was very shy and introverted. Um, and he, de- he described a situation when he was a teenager, uh, and his, his mum would send him to these youth camps you know, once a year, and he hated it. It was like a whole room full of young people that he didn't know. You know it was his kind of I- idea of a, a, like a trial, really. And after a few years of going, he, he said to his mum, Mum, I-, I don't want to go anymore. I don't like it. I feel out of place. I don't know what to do with myself. Um, And she said to him, she said, look, there'll be people there who are more nervous than you are. There'll be people there who feel more on the edge than you do. So instead of focusing on yourself, why don't you look out for them and just quietly get alongside them? And he said that completely transformed his experience of those camps. You know, because actually now he went and he he noticed, you know, there were other people who were stood around the edges who didn't know other people. And he got alongside them and actually was really able to encourage them. And that's the same, isn't it, among us? You might be sitting here this morning thinking, I don't know anyone. You, know, you might be feeling nervous about that idea of encouraging. But there'll be others who, who are feeling the same way. And actually, you know, again, we can come with that idea, can't we? Let, I'm going to look out for someone who's sat on their own and go and get to know them. Well, we need to start um, drawing to a conclusion. But we, you know, this is, we meet together as a, as a family to worship God to hear from his word, and to encourage one another. And that's something we value because it's something God values. You know, so we saw, didn't we, when God's spirit came, it, it called his com- a community together. And where does all this end? Well, in Revelation 7, we get this vision, don't we, of heaven, a vision of what is to come. And listen to the description. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. See, God's Spirit comes and draws together a gathering of his people. And where does it end? A great gathering of God's people. You know, who are worshipping him, praising him together. So actually, if gathering is something we're not excited about, you see, as God's people, we're missing something, aren't we? Because God's excited about this. the illustration that came to my mind, you know, we, we um, over a few, a few years, we've had a kind of family holiday with the wider family on Alice's side. Um, and in God's kindness, you know, we get on really well as a family. And so those have been really precious weeks. And I think at the end of that week, there's often a feeling among us, we'd love to just keep doing this. You know, it's been such a good time, but we know actually now's the time to depart because God's called us into different contexts. Now, I know not everyone has that experience of family holidays. You know, you might be glad to get back at the end of a family holiday. But don't we long for that to be what it's like for us as a family? You know, as we come together, there's a sense, I, just, I wish we could keep going. But actually, we know God has called us into the world, don't we? He's called us into different contexts and workplace, into different communities to share the good news with others. And as we, as we go through this series, we're going to see a bit of a pattern. So you can see it on this um, picture so we, we are gathering, if we could have the next slide up, our gathering should send us out. You know, so actually as we gather together, you know, we're, we're encouraged, but then actually we're sent out, aren't we? 
into the week, but also into the world, into the different context that God's called us. And our longing is as we go out, equipped and encouraged, we share something of the love of God with those that we're with. So we go out into the world. But as we go, we invite others, you know, to then come and gather with us. We share the good news of the gospel and others are drawn in to gather. You know, but my, you know, that's, that's our, our longing, you know, that we're a church who we love to be together. And actually, there's a, you know, but we know there are times when we need to go back into the world because that's what he's called us to. And actually, that's been my experience of Sunbridge. You know, that's, that's in our history. Um, lots of people have told me about days when they'd be here on a Saturday night, on a Sunday morning, a Sunday afternoon, and a Sunday night, not because they had to, but because they wanted to be with God's people. And actually, that was one of the things I really noticed, you know, in the first six months before everything got changed, was, was after the services, you know, people didn't want to leave. There was a great buzz, wasn't there, in the lounge, because we wanted to be together as God's people. That's what we're like as a family, um, because that's something that God values. Now, in this series, each week, I just want to finish with four concrete steps. You know, sometimes we can hear something, can't we, and think, okay, what's next for me? And they'll be a bit different, because each of us will be starting in different places. But these are kind of invitations, really, you know, to embrace these values together. So the four this week, um, come. You know, maybe, actually, you've never come in person. Um, you know, maybe you've been watching these services online, um, and you're, maybe you're just starting to think about who Jesus is and, and what he means and what you know, Christianity is all about. Well, come to something in person. It's been great that a few people have done that recently. Um, and we've really been able to get to know each other, you know, and, and become part of the family and plug in and contribute and engage. So that might be, you know, the next step for you. It might be just to come down and introduce yourself to people. It might be to return. You know, there are some who still haven't returned in person. I know that people have, have not come in person for all kinds of different reasons. You know, some are it's health concerns, some it's a concern about the way we're um, implementing things like masks and that kind of thing. There's all kinds of different reasons, aren't there? But my encouragement would be that as a church, particularly as restrictions lift, let's get out of the habit of being online, if we're in the habit of being online, and commit to gathering together in person as God's people. You know, maybe you need to say, you know, going forward, when there's an option, I can come in person, I'll come in person so that I can encourage other brothers and sisters the third kind of step forward is to encourage. You know, maybe you're someone who is here regularly, but actually, if you're honest, you kind of come, function on your own, and then leave. So maybe the next step, actually, is, is to start asking the question. Maybe pray on your way to the gathering. Lord, give me an opportunity. You know, and that might not be our Sunday service. It might be a growth group. It might be meeting up. But why don't you pray that prayer? Give me an opportunity to encourage someone in this gathering and see how the Lord uses that. And that just the last um, kind of... Um, next step is to invite you know what sometimes it takes an invitation doesn't it to help someone come back to gathering with God's people or to come for the first time um, and it might be that actually we're aware of people who aren't meeting regularly at the moment have drifted out of fellowship perhaps so so maybe the next step for us is to think of who those people are and to get in touch and to say how are you doing you know what are you thinking about coming back to, to talk about our experience of that, maybe even to help them with transport. You know, sometimes that's the thing that's difficult for people, isn't it? They live a long way away, or they don't have transport. Actually, Reza and Lee were, were sharing with me last week how, for a long season for them, you know, Mark and Dorothy Pierce would go and pick them up from Keithley every week, not just on a Sunday, but midweek, and bring them so they could gather. And we need more of that, don't we? So maybe that could be your role. You can think of someone who you think, actually, if I got alongside them, I think that would help them to, to gather and to be part of what's going on. So let's, you know, this, is a, this matters to the Lord, doesn't it? You know, this is what he's doing, is, is gathering together a people. Um, so let's pray that the Lord does that. There's something we would delight in and continue to rejoice in. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for the invitation to gather as your people. We thank you that you have included us in Christ. And we thank you that your spirit is at work to draw us together as a people. Lord, we, we love this vision that you have to gather together a people from all kinds of backgrounds and contexts and cultures who are united in the Lord Jesus. Lord, we've felt at times the temptation that we read of in the book of Hebrews, the temptation and the risk of drifting away. Lord, we pray for those who are maybe particularly at risk at that at the moment. Lord, we help us to heed those words, to not give up meeting together, and we pray, Lord God, that our gathering together as your people would in no way be um, merely a duty 
but would be a joy and a delight. Lord, we thank you that that is already the case. But we pray more and more, Lord God, that we would be a family that loves to be together. Lord, that loves to gather together to worship you, to hear from your word, and to encourage one another. So you know, Lord God, what is right for each of us as we go from here. Uh, Put something on our hearts, Lord God, that we might grow into uh, this valley, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.